Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Okay, Claude is good. Everybody else is bad. I see how it is. And we're just going to leave it at that. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Brandon. I am the associate pastor here at Swiss Cove Christian Church, and I'm really excited to continue in our series, Core Claims. We're looking at a couple core claims of Christianity, and today we're looking at quite possibly the biggest one of all the, all the claims that Christianity makes, both in and out of this series. Today is a big one. We're talking about the resurrection and believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and belief is an interesting concept. What we choose to believe in varies wildly from human to human. And if you know me well, my volunteers know this, the staff here knows this, my, my very close friends know that I love conspiracy theories. I absolutely, and when I say love, I mean love conspiracy theories. I've um, railroaded staff meeting many times with brand new conspiracy theories that I've learned about that I have to share. Um, and I don't believe in a lot of them, but, but I love researching them and love learning about them. And one of my all-time favorite conspiracy theories is a group of people, and you guys have probably heard this before, maybe, maybe not, who believe that birds are not real, that birds aren't real. And I've done hours and hours of research. And when I say hours, guys, I cannot explain to you how extensive the word hours means here. But I've done hours of research and have narrowed it down to two types of birds, pigeons and crows. Pigeons and crows, they are not real. Um, they're government drones, and that's what they do. Uh, that's why when you go to Bucky's down in St. Augustine, you see them hopping around, or you're in Walmart, they're inspecting your cars, they're looking to see if anything's wrong, and that's why when the government shuts down, you don't see crows and pigeons anymore, and that's because they're not real. Now, I, I want you guys to know that I do believe, I do know that crows and pigeons are, are real. Um, I do know this, but I, I thank you, thank you, thank you. But, um, <laughs> but I say that to tell you that one day I was talking to Eden, Elliot and Abby's daughter. She's in third grade, and third graders ask great questions, and Eden walks up to me, and she goes, Mr. Brandon, why do birds sit on power lines? And I just could not help myself in this moment, and I said, Eden, that's because birds are government drones, and, <laughs> and they sit on the power lines to recharge. Um, and so some things are really hard to believe, but for a third grader, this was very easy to grasp. And so I walked away from this conversation and I was like, man, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for that. And sure enough, we walk into the office on Monday and Abby goes, Hey, um, did you tell my daughter that burns aren't real? And I was like, sure did. <laughs> yeah, that was me. Um, you know, some things are hard to believe, but you know, I like to say unicorns and dragons are both real. Sometimes I'll say the earth is flat. I'm very aware that the earth is a sphere. Um, unicorns are fake. Dragons were real. I'll debate that anytime you guys want on a later day. Um, but I, I don't believe any of these things because I know that they're kind of ridiculous and they're fun to laugh at. Um, but there are people, however, who do believe in a lot of these conspiracy theories. And we're actually sitting in this room because we believe in or are very interested in believing in something that's pretty crazy. And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's crazy because, I don't know if you guys know this, but most dead people stay dead. They don't, they don't come back to life. Like we have zombie apocalypse movies, but Jesus isn't in any of them. Um, but we believe that Jesus Christ did not stay dead. And I want to open by reading a section of scripture from 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 14. If Christ has not been raised... Our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. You'll hear people say that religion is in our worlds to give it structure. You'll hear people say that we have God to help us create a moral system for our lives, but that he's not actually 
real. And we look at conspiracy theorists and we laugh and we think they're kind of crazy, but the non-Christian world looks in at us and says the same exact thing. And they ask a very important question, why? Why are you here? Why meet on Sunday? Why change your life? Why give 10%? Why meet with a life group every week? Why study some weird book that's thousands of years old? Why? And here's why. It's a creed from 1 Corinthians 13, just a couple verses before what we just read. For what I received, I pass on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters simultaneously, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Today we're looking at the resurrection of Jesus. It's why we're here, right? We're here because we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And we're going to speed through some non-biblical evidences and then dive into scripture. But just like last week, we're going to answer a couple questions. And the first question we need to answer this week is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And C.S. Lewis very famously answered this question in his book, Mere Christianity. And this was his answer. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him being Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet, call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. And and that's what we claim as Christians, right? We claim that Jesus wasn't just a teacher. We don't claim that Jesus was just a man. We believe that Jesus of Nazareth was born to the Virgin Mary. We believe that he is the Son of God and that he rose from the grave to save us from our sins. And if you have any more questions about the first part of that, Jesus being a man, living a real life, all those things, come and talk to us. Find us with a name tag. You can do that right now. Um, You can email us at hello, because the next part of this message is going to get really weird if you don't even believe that Jesus walked this earth. And that next part that we're getting into is the resurrection. I like Lee Strobel's breakdown of the resurrection in his book, Case for Christ. Uh, He breaks down the physical resurrection into four categories of evidence. He looks at medical evidence, He looks at evidence of the missing body, evidence of appearances after death. Um, And then he looks at circumstantial evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And um, we don't have a ton of time to go through each one of these chapters, but just like last week, I highly suggest diving into these sources yourself if you're interested in this kind of stuff to go through and read what Strobel um, and some of these other authors have to say about these topics. But... Uh, This brings us to our next question. So who is Jesus? We believe that he is the son of God. And then the next question we need to ask is, did Jesus die on the cross? Because there's a lot of people out there who teach that Jesus did not, in fact, die on the cross. The Quran teaches that, is one of those teachings. They teach that he didn't die on the cross. They think that Jesus uh, was resuscitated, not resurrected. So this theory states that Jesus was given some type of drug or passed out Uh, to wake up later like we would see in some kind of weird movie or something. Hence, you know, the empty tomb that Jesus would have been able to walk out of the tomb after this. And if you would like to look into this theory more, it's called the swoon hypothesis. It's talked about quite a bit. It's been disproven quite a few times, but I'm going to summarize Strobel's answer for you. He pretty much says that being that Jesus was beaten to the point of death, hung on a cross with nails, holes, you know, in 
the wrists and the ankles, stabbed in the heart, he would not have been able to fake his death. He wouldn't have been able to get up and move the stone and get past Roman guards. He would not have been able to walk with his friends, with Marys, on the road to Emmaus. He would certainly not have been able to convince a group of people that he was God. So did Jesus die on the cross? Absolutely, we believe he did. So next we have to ask, well, if he died on the cross, where'd the body go? Right, because that's what happens is there's burials after a death. And Christianity obviously claims that Jesus was risen from the grave, but we did bury him. We buried him in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Um, and Strobel and William Lane Craig, who we talked about last week, discuss why Jesus' body is missing. And I love this quote from Craig. He says, <clears throat> I'll add that if this burial by Joseph of Arimathea were a legend that developed later, you'd expect to find other competing burial traditions about what happened to Jesus' body. However, you don't find these at all. Through multiple eyewitness accounts and the use of people's names, it's really important, the use of people's names in the Gospels and in the writings of Scripture, the writers were allowing the people of that time to search for answers themselves. They were saying, hey, this person saw the empty tomb, the the apostles, the disciples, these people saw Jesus alive. Go ask them. Check your sources. Cite. Go see if what we're saying is true. And there weren't any competing arguments back then about where Jesus' tomb was, and that's why we have no idea today where it actually is. And, and that's why this is more of a today issue than an issue back then, because back then they had eyewitness accounts of all of this information. And the gospel writers, they do an excellent job of not fabricating a story. They do an excellent job of not fabricating a story, which is addressed many times through Case for Christ. Um, but that human nature, it comes through in the scripture we're about to examine. And I want to summarize a section of Reason for God by Timothy Keller. And he's talking about Matthew chapter 28. If you want to turn there now, we're going to dive into that here in a second. But in Matthew chapter 28, we see people's natural reactions that anyone would have at the moment of Jesus' resurrection. Whether a scientific or primitive response, this is how people would react. And we get into Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, I don't know which Mary, there's 15 of them, went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone sat on, and sat on it. <clears throat> his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. Tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings. Notice in this gospel account, we know who he's meeting with. The writers aren't leaving this up for debate. You can go and ask who he's meeting with. Greetings, Mary and the other Mary. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan and gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. This is a huge sentence because back then, Roman soldiers, if their post was left or they were unsuccessful in what they were assigned to, they were to be beheaded. So, so you can see the soldiers going to the priests. They're not going to the Roman government. They're going to the priest being like, hey, 
you know, the dead guy you told us to watch, we lost him. Um, and, and the priests say, you know what? Tell everyone that a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors came and robbed a bunch of highly trained assassins. I mean, that's, that's what it reads as. And, and, and robbed these highly trained killers a body and rolled a giant stone away. And this is what we're going to tell everyone and we're going to smooth it over. We're going to make sure that you're not in trouble at all. If this report gets to the governor, we will surely, <clears throat> we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did what, as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I think we could do a whole sermon series on that chapter, but I read the whole thing to get a look at the big picture. We get to see that Scripture addresses issue after issue after issue in this chapter uh, of what people were we're saying and we're going to say about Jesus. They know the concerns that were floating around at the time. They address the stolen body theory. They tell us, hey, guys, this is, this is what happened. They give us the names of people who saw Jesus, the disciples. We knew who those people were, Mary and the other Mary. They tell the people, go and check our sources. Go and see. They show Jesus appearing to eyewitnesses. And when this was written, all those people were still alive. This is less than 10 years after Jesus' death. Chapter 28 of the Gospel of Matthew then ends with probably the most famous command that was ever given. And it's the one that addresses the or very original question we ask today. Why? Why are you here? Why do you come to church? Why do we give up an hour on Sunday mornings to be here, an hour during the week to meet in life groups? Why do we serve? Why? And it's because if Jesus is God and he rose from the grave, then it should change absolutely everything about your life. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Because when you believe in Jesus, you no longer become the main focus of your life. It's not a you-centered life. It's not about your job, your family, your kids, your financial situation. If the resurrection is real, then your life focus becomes going out into all the world and making disciples. And thankfully, Jesus told us exactly how to make a disciple straight from his mouth. A disciple is made by baptizing them in the name of God the Father and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey the commands of Scripture. And if the resurrection is real, we should change everything about our lives. It should shift the focus from a me-centered life to a Jesus-centered life. And if you want to know more about this life change, more about a relationship with Jesus, more about the guy that came and died on a cross for you and me so that we could be saved and reconnect with God, come down front and talk to myself or Elliot. We'll be right here. Find someone with a name tag their staff or an elder, email us at hello at swisscovechristian.com. We would love to talk to you about what that means. But we're just scratching the surface of all the scientific evidence that there is for Jesus. We only got to look at one chapter in an entire book, and I'm not talking about the book of Matthew, I'm talking about the Bible, that is focused around the resurrection of Jesus. But if the resurrection is real, and here at Swiss Cove, we believe that it is, then it should change everything, everything, about our lives. Our focus should be the Great Commission, making disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey. It's why the mission of Swiss Cove Christian Church is to give glory to God and make disciples of the nations. Last week, we, we looked at creation, and we looked at the first part of that mission, that we were created to give glory to God. And the resurrection tells us and looks at us and says, this is why the second part is there, to make disciples of the nations. So I'm going to end with a question that we've been asking all day. Why are you here? Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything you've done. We thank you for sending your son Jesus down to earth to live a perfect life, to be beaten, scorned, mocked, hung on a cross, died, buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and then raised from the grave three days later. And he did all that so that we could have a relationship with you. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.